Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dr. Deep State. So it's been a while since I've seen y'all. Uh, I have a show for you today. It might even be a series called Into the Medic Sea. And I have a special guest today named Will, and I want to introduce that guest. But before I get started, uh, Will reached out to me, and we have been communicating, and he's got so many great ideas um, that we are exchanging together, especially in this book that I'm working on. And he's been very helpful. And I said, hey, you know, it would be really helpful if you would uh, communicate with me on Dr. Deep State and we could run some ideas uh, together. And I think one of the things that we really have in common is we're seeing so much of going, what's going on today in the world um, in sort of this big picture thing that we decided to call the medicsy and sort of develop that idea a little bit. But, uh, Will, I want you to, by, by the way, I'm doing this low tech. So, uh, I'm going to show you Will's face a little bit and then Will's going to introduce himself to y'all. Good. How are you doing, Doug? I'm okay. <laughs> so that's Will. Will is out in Kentucky. And can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, Will, and how you found uh, this, this line of research and thinking and Dr. Deep State? Sure. Um, so I am a, a, a trained uh, sculptor, artist. I went to school, have a graduate degree in, um, in studio art, uh, and I'm from Kentucky. Um, I did work in sculpture and I uh, did a little reading and researching and um, some, some academic uh, writing. When I was in school, I taught for a while at the college level. Um, and then about 2013, I stumbled into uh, conspiracy research. Uh, a lot of things I was trying to make sense of in the world stopped making sense. And uh, that was around the time of the Snowden leaks. And uh, I saw this 9-11 documentary. And then from there, I was down the rabbit hole. And Down uh, the rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, you know, I've, I've, I, I dove pretty deeply into that. It took me down a pretty dark path, but um, also opened me back up to my Christian faith and background. I was raised to uh, sort of a non-denominational Protestant church, um, and I kind of put all that stuff away when I went to college, like a lot of people. And uh, I got to interrupt and, you. So far, you're tracking like 100% with me about the timing of kind of uh, seeing this light and seeing this light and uh, kind of getting pushed out of one sort of career path. Um, I keep going, Will. Okay. Uh, so uh, that led me down the kind of dark path, uh, sort of researching the occult and not being able to stop thinking about and making connections between, you know, Aleister Crowley and, and Thermite and uh, black, babbling about this stuff to all my friends and loved ones. And they all looked at me like I was crazy and I just felt so alone. Um, and uh, I was kind of in between um, teaching gigs at that time. Um, my wife and I always had this dream of moving back to Kentucky and having a farm and um, living kind of on the land and, and this sort of thing. And uh, we took a risk and, um, and moved and uh, we lived in a pretty remote cabin and uh, I was, you know, had a satellite internet connection and I was just, you know, John D and, and uh, you know, alchemy and all the, all the things that your listeners probably uh, know about and have done likewise. And, um, I, but it, it, it was really like a time where I, I was more focused on the dark side of things and trying to un, unravel this and make all these connections for myself to better understand the world, the corruption with it, that was in it. And um, I guess it was a sense that there was an absolute evil when before I thought that all evil was relative and um, situational. And um, that opened me back up to the idea of, of an absolute good and to God and this kind of like what you've called a, a cosmic conspiracy and a um, campaign for Armageddon. And I, um, uh, anyway, I, um, I, I guess I, I started to explore my faith a little bit more, but I was pretty tepid and um, undecided at first. So anyway, I, I ended up kind of losing everything. I lost my, um, well, not everything. I lost my teaching career and I had to go back 
uh, working for my family business and construction. And uh, I thought that was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. But then um, shortly thereafter, my wife and I had our first child and um, she was born with uh, a pretty severe disability. Um, we, we call it cerebral palsy. Uh, that's what she's been diagnosed with, but that's more just a symptomatic diagnosis than really a, a cause. Um, so uh, I started a new life as a special needs dad and um, I've kind of put away uh, for, for a period of time my conspiracy research because I just felt stink bit. I felt like I'd lost everything um, and I was kind of scared in a way. Uh, and then, you know, last year happened and I uh, said, you know, I, this this is <laughs> it feels like this is really happening this time. And uh, I've kind of gone through several phases uh, uh, in my research since last year. Um, you know, um, I didn't didn't know about the QAnon uh, uh, theories initially, and I uh, started looking into that a little bit. I'm like, wait a second, this this sounds like a, a kind of false opposition, but you know, there's some truth here, and obviously some deception, and then. Um, Anyway, I, I, I finally ended up, someone recommended me to your channel, and uh, it really, uh, I know I'm going to sound like a yes man and a sycophant, but you connected all the dots for me, and um, I feel like now uh, I've, I've tried to watch all your videos and, and read all your sources and read your book, and uh, uh, I'm just really thankful that, that we've made this connection, and um, I feel like I have such a better understanding of, um, of all the questions that I've had, so that's pretty general uh no i appreciate that and uh whether i ever get back to y'all talking about how my semester went at getting through to people um sometimes with dr deep state or trying to be more direct with my students a lot of times for real like next semester i think this just ain't worth it um but then there are those people now and again, and you kind of go, okay, well, at least at least someone got through to me. And I've, I've, I've had other people reach out besides Will. So it is very, I, I definitely appreciate it. But Will's unique. And I have another friend someday I might bring on here from California who just can track, you know, just can track with me 100% on the singularity concepts and you know, transhumanism and these sorts of things. Um, but Will and I are especially going to connect around the idea of the medicsy, and we're going to try to to baby step this in today because it's really today is more about a meet and greet. Um, we're going to baby step our way into the concept of the medicsy, and um, kind of hopefully just explain why we think this could be a platform for something we want to develop for a little while. So if you go to Wikipedia, you're going to see basically two references for this: Plato and Vogelin. So there's not much there. So we're working off those two principal ideas. Uh, Plato is a pre-Christian thinker that is heavily used. It really is uh, Vogelin's number one philosopher that he uses throughout his career. So he extends it to some extent. It always has a hint of Christianity to it and especially Catholicism. But Vogelin is first and foremost a philosopher. So, okay, for Vogelin, a well-ordered world has to do with a well-ordered consciousness. So there's a relationship between the individual consciousness, the collective consciousness, and the sort of cosmos. And they all come in sync together. I want to keep this kind of, kind of, and he said a good regime over time, whether it's a king or an oligarch or whatever it might be, a good regime is aware of these kind of what Plato or Platonus brought to life is that there's a, there's a world of forms, there's a world of transcendence outside of our world. And in some ways, our world is even just an imitation of this world. And that was a huge revolution in thought that happened in the third and fourth century um, BC. And the idea that there is a, a sort of good out there um, and that that good is connected to the, the good of the individual. Somebody that heads the regime can realize that a well-ordered society depends on the relationship between sort of the heavens and the man or the city, as Plato would say. So he'd say an ideal world is one where the regime, we'll call it like the king, could or the ruler could crack the soul open or direct the souls, the collective souls, 
toward a loving relationship with God or truth. And this would be, you know, a philosopher king because he loves truth for its own sake. He's not a sophist. He's not self-interestedly interested in politics. So that's where Vogelin's going. And for Vogelin, he really thought the Middle Ages, even though we don't think about it this way, the Middle Ages was a well-balanced kind of millennial period where the dominant regimes were first and foremost interested in the souls of man and at least t pointing them toward uh, p pointing them in a loving openness to god and so i believe that speaks in many ways to the situation that we have today and i believe it also can um, open a dialogue between truths of the past and truths of the present or truths that are also unique uh, to the Christian faith or uh, particularly to Roman and Eastern Catholicism. So that's just me talking briefly about the Medici. It's this space um, where order and balance come together. Today I was doing a lecture on the judicial system and I said the balance, the microcosm in the courtroom is kind of like a balance within the checks and balances of society, which can also even be extended into a, a, a macro balance in the universe. And so why does Lady Justice have the blindfold? Why do we have to to uh, sort of scales there. And Will was mentioning the other day how all the references in the Old Testament to scales. So we have so much to work with with this idea in our own minds of a balanced consciousness and how that relates to a balanced society and the state of affairs throughout history in terms of the notion of balance. I'm talking so much over here. Will, please. This speaks to you, you said, in so many ways that you could run with it. And he's constantly laying new ideas on me. But I think at some level, he just it speaks to him even just in his own life or his own sort of, it speaks to him, his own personal affairs. Will, are you there? Yeah. Uh, so um, I guess back to where I was talking um, before with this like sort of opening into conspiracy research it it became like a cave like a conspiracy cave of these flashes of revelation or these connections to um some hidden knowledge that i couldn't quite reach out and touch or uh, make sense of or, or place in a larger framework and um i realized that i needed a faith or i needed um some type of stasis or structure that I could pull these things into to at least just have internal peace. Um, at the same time, I'm coming to terms with my daughter's condition and how that changes my expectations for what my life is going to be like. Um, and so when I try to explain to people, it's hard, it's hard to explain what it's like, or, or a lot of people can't look at it. Um, that's the, you know what it, the psychological state of being in the situation that i'm in and um some people do you know, some people are really respond and want to reach out and have some type of connection but for the most part especially parents it's like a there's like a block there or mm. like um and i think it has something to do with loss or death like uh the finality of death is you know there's a, a period of mourning and then there's acceptance and then there's absence but in the situation where you have like my daughter's situation, she needs pretty much total care of, you know, bathing, pottying, feeding. She is up for a couple hours in the middle of the night, most nights. Um, so it's, it's a kind of constant daily battle for my wife and I to, um, to handle and to juggle with all of our other responsibilities and then maintain uh, a well-ordered mind uh, on top of this to, you know, not just <laughs> plummet into despair and chaos every day. So uh, kind of coming out of my conspiracy world, coming to, to grips with my daughter and then this sort of prolonged developmental stage of, you know, is she going to do this? Is she going to do that? And just the pain of that, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for people to imagine like what those, my parents, those, child wellness checks of you know developmental stages and, and and milestones feel like when you're on the other side of that or when you're always um anticipating something that's not that's not going to happen um so trying to pull this back to medicsy um i think you did a great job i keep going please 
But I mean, that was a wonderful answer. Um, the equanimity we need just to survive. And and uh, part of how this is part of our own redemptive tale of our own lives, but what's placed on you is so uniquely heavy. Um, yeah. And I could see why without a certain type of faith, it could be very challenging. Right. Um, and there are these like fragments or uh, I guess what you would call, you know, the, the realm of things and the realm of forms uh, in the realm of things, these, these little breakthroughs or these uh, events, like my daughter was born at the moment of like Zika virus taking over the political or, you know, news media. And my daughter has, was diagnosed with microcephaly. And so there was like literally the, the week after we get this diagnosis, that word is on every news source. And I'm, just, I'm thinking, what, what does this all mean? Is there some sort of connection here? And um, it's like, a, it, it feels like being constantly provoked to despair and having to fight against that or, or, or place it in like a long, a long view of, of um you know the hope of of her healing or the hope of her um you know the, the way that she can reach other people and her struggle can can have an effect on others um so anyway no that's good uh, that's good um you know and, and it and, and it puts scripture you know into uh a greater context in christ's you know miracles and and focus on you know people with disabilities like the cripple at the pool or yeah the paralytic and, at Capernaum. And Jesus and, tells uh, you those people you don't look at those there goes there that that's who I was I was that person and I know in Catholicism they have a distinctive that they have a special role a redemptive role for suffering it's it's very much intertwined in the theology um but yeah. I want to pick up on this again I love that response will and um you as a special needs dad, how something as abstract as the medicsy speaks to you on almost a daily basis about this balance, again, at the biological, um, how other people or society views you or rejects you, and how that even plays into something that might have cosmic scales to it. So let's right. let's pick up a little bit more on this idea of of the cave, and let's talk a little personally about our own journeys inside of the cave. Okay, I want to work with the medicsy idea, and just one of the most basic ways to kind of build up this idea um, that I believe can be a framework for a, a whole dialogue down the road. But let's start out by comparing it to uh, the old saw, the old allegory of Plato's cave. And for Plato, of course, people are prisoners. The, the Gnostic mind thinks of, again, the whole world. We're all part of, as Alex Jones would say, the prison planet. And so we're, we're prisoners, we're chained. But for whatever reason, somebody becomes free and goes to the back of the cave. For Vogelin, as for Plato, it was a mysterious pulling, the very grounding of transcendence. It's almost a Calvinistic idea where, where you're called. It's not necessarily something of your own will. We're mysteriously called to the back of that cave. But there is this moment when we look out and we see the light, the forms, the beauty, the perfection, the transcendence. And there's an awareness at this moment that there's the people back in the cave that are kind of caught up in almost like a beastly type of, of, of affair of being. So there's this moment where we're somewhere, we're caught in this world, somewhere between the gods and the, the animals, the creatures. And what do we do with this uh, kind of thinking? Um, where I'm kind of going with this is, you know, I could take this back to some moment of awakening where I realized, you know, oh, there is a transcendent form, there is a God, or it might be biblical, these kind of, or this idea that, you know, uh, Christ really did start a church and he really did start a hierarchy and he really did, um, you know, have a charismatic chain of command that he that he ordered. This was a big awakening for me. Um, so people do have these 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 aha moments. Where I'm kind of going more in my life today is seeing on a day to day that this is sometimes a it's a huge moment an epiphany, but it's also something daily that we slog through this relationship of kind of being in the world 
and yet outside of it. Um, sometimes in theology, there's this expression that's um, already not yet, um, that we're part of this promised kingdom, but we need to live it out in a certain way. So that's one of the many ways that can go. For Vogelin, he thought life, the Christian life, and he's talking as an observer, is it's a hard, boring, oftentimes just it's it's not all about having the excitement and the hands in the air at, at, you know, when the volumes on number 11, the church fathers thought that that was really opening yourself up to elemental uh, spirits. The, the Holy Spirit is the spirit that convicts you, that realizes, you know what, the sin is not out there in the world. It's, it's right here and it has to be addressed. But he, for Vogelin, part of the medicsy was just that boring, long schlog through the life of faith, not the life of the eyes, the excitement, the titillation, the sensual uh, life, but the, the eyes that do not see, or as Paul would say, you know, making it all the way to the end of the race. But I want to flip it over to Will, because he's, uh, he's, he's going to give you kind of a little bit of a personal kind of take on the cave, and, and uh, he just explained it to me. We have to go off air because everything has to render here, and I liked what he had to say. So, so Will, talk to me about the cave and what what you've been thinking i think maybe your ideas change from time to time mine certainly do but where are you at today with cave ideas <laughs> um, yeah i think that applies to the stage i was in of of um kind of catching a glimpse of of conspiracy and uh making connections and then that that process of of waking up to conspiracy is sort of the exiting of the cave. Uh, it's a arduous process. Uh, you know, it's dark and lonely and you don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, and, um, so there's that aspect. And then there's also the cave of despair and a sense of like my daughter's condition and, and being, um, yeah. hard days lost in this, uh, feeling of, of, of being disconnected from the spirit, from the source of, of peace and understanding and um, feeling like I'm um, being swallowed up and in, in the despair of, uh, of, of, you know, um, ignorance and not knowing the meaning of all this. And so anyway, um, I, to, to go back to, I guess, the medic a little bit, I would think I was uh, one of the scriptures that really stands out to me and, you know, Christ's, I'm not sure if I, I was talking about this in the last segment or not, but um, Christ focused on people who are blind and deaf and crippled and paralytic and have seizures. And uh, this over and over again, his miracles are focused on people who have these, um, you know, chronic physical ailments and the struggle of their daily life and lifting that struggle away from them. And I guess the profundity of that, of that, um, uh, lifting of, of burden is something that's hard for people to understand if, if they've not experienced it. I mean, there's the burden of death that almost everyone's experienced of a loved one in that loss, but then the burden of perpetual, the perpetual reminder of death in someone's chronic disability and, you know, the, this hopelessness that it will never go away mm -hmm. and this is going to be life from now on. For that to be lifted is something that's so profound. And, and to think about like a community of that time and how visible someone with a disability was and what a constant reminder of of the fragility of life and and kind of the, the troubles that can fall on someone that, that must have been but then I'm, I'm so john 9 3 is a scripture that really stands out to me because there's this um i, I could call it a materialist view and people's minds of disability like you have on the one sense from a christian or evangelical perspective that disability is a punishment from god uh, and you have scriptures in the Old Testament that attest to, you know, curses being placed upon children and grandchildren in seven generations. Um, and then you have the other materialist view that I, I see from more of a secular perspective. I hear people say this all the time, like, you know, disability children have autism because, oh, their parents use drugs or because of inoculations that someone received or, um, and, you know, those may be the case in some instances, but uh, you know, a lot of cases not. A lot of times it's just uh, something that escapes our understanding. And um, 
uh, the first John nine three, where Christ is asked by the rabbis, um, uh, you know, uh, of, of a blind man, said they asked him, was it this man who sinned or his parents who sinned? Uh, and Christ responds that neither his, neither his parents or him, but so that his work could be seen in the world. And um, that those words to someone in my situation are so. Um, uh, promising and and healing and um, benevolent because there's this constant thought in the back of my mind, like what did I do to bring this on myself? But then I'm also reminded that, and this is the medicine of the situation. I think is that yeah, I did many things to deserve it. I did deserve it. You know, people oftentimes in try to try to comfort will say, "You didn't do anything to deserve this. It's not your fault." And I, you know, I've realized that. No, I have. I've done many things to deserve this. And accepting that is part of understanding the nature of, of sin and redemption. And um, I, I think uh, there's the other example in Scripture of when Jesus heals the paralytic at, um, at the pool and says to, or the cripple at the pool, and he says, um, your, your sins are forgiven. Lift up your mat. And that. So there, there seems to be a balance there. But and I want to interrupt you really quick with that one. It's an interesting little caveat. He asks first, do you want to be healed? And our minds would say, well, of course, you know, I, but that's an interesting question because a lot of times we get accustomed to people taking care of us or maybe the government taking care of us, our families taking care of us. And that's an interesting point that Jesus said, do you want to be healed? And he said, yes. And he's essentially healed because of his faith. I'm sorry for the interruption. Go on, William. Um, so, yeah, um, the um, and that's that's another aspect too I want to address. I guess is like it's easy for me to be caught up in my own suffering, but then to think about my daughter and the meaning of her suffering, you know, and how to place that in some type of um you know, spiritual or philosophical context, what, what is the meaning of her life? You know, what does her, um, do her thoughts and what does her suffering mean? And, um, uh, you know, like her inability to play on a playground or to experience the things that other children experience, mm -hmm. like what, what is God's plan for that? Or what is God's purpose for that? And why, why do I, why does this, why me, you know? Um, and so making sense of that is kind of the, the medicine of my, uh, it's it's very real. Talking. It's very real. I'm glad you brought that up. And what I could even balance that out, what, what we're going to start talking about is for Vogelin, there's a reality. There's a real reality in the world, an ontology between man and God and society. And then there's people that say these kind of second realities to pull us out of the medicine. And in modernity, it can be almost anything, right? The creation of this separate mind. Um, but what you could balance those moments that we have of shame or... Um, to sin, or should we have responsibility? The other side of the medicine, um, I think, could also include this beatific vision. Uh, and I'll throw a definition out here for you of it, but it's like this spectacular conclusion to all affairs and everything that we desire, everything that was taken away from us in the fall, comes to us in, in an unspeakable vision of the um, completion of all things um, and a direct communion with God. Again, when we say already, not yet, we get some of that communion as, as we take communion and hopefully we do it uh, through a process of absolution of sin. But yes, we have these extremes between extreme pain and self-affliction to this these moments of uh, a beatific vision of, of perfect ecstasy, sort of like uh, at my parish uh, next to the cross, there's Michelangelo's uh, ecstasy scene. Um, and so these are all part of a reality that can be inside the medicine. And we want to slowly address how those extremes can still stay in balance in our own minds or in society. And what are the parameters for when things get outside of the medicine? Um, but when we pick up on the other side, I think we want to talk uh, a little bit about maybe the uh, conspiracy zone and uh, maybe a couple thoughts that are controversial, big time if we can get to it, by a couple uh, voices um, whom are archbishops speaking out and very much 
using the ma- language of the Medici and how the whole Enlightenment project has kind of taken us out of the Medici and the balance and so forth. So if, if we can do it, we're going to try to get around to those conversations today. Uh, so we're going to get with you on the other side. So for this next segment, we decided to talk about conspiracy theory and um, the idea of the conspiracy in the Medici. And this is something that we could go on and on and on and on about. And we probably will hit it from time to time, this idea. Um, I'm assuming you're kind of familiar with these ideas or trutherism or something if you're here listening with us. And we jo- we both just shared a little bit how both of we had spiritual awakenings and awakening to, you know, sort of uh, the NWO kind of stuff. But um, is it healthy? Um, I think that I think most of us would agree just that there's probably some kind of balance between opening up and being able to question that maybe the government lies to you on occasion um, to being obsessed with conspiracy theory. Um, I want to have Will's take on this. Um, I'm just guessing if you're out there. Um, I opened it. I, I, I introduced this topic, maybe not so well, about eight months ago when I started kind of rethinking this book that I was going to write and so forth. Um, you know, my feeling is definitely the world starts to more and more feel like it's filled with infinite rabbit holes that one could go down and one has to sort of be able to restrain oneself. And Will's even got, you know, ideas about how the Bible speaks about a certain kind of restrainer. And both from an orthodox and evangelical perspective, we talk about a time, perhaps future time, where there'll be a restrainer. It could be, it's been speculated, is it St. Michael? Is it the church? Is it uh, just the level of sin in the world will kind of be pulled back and maybe there's a binding that's released and Satan will will come upon the world in a new and more aggressive a, a way. Um, but in short, um, I'm, I'll just keep it simple with me. Um, when I see people just out there that I tend to listen to in YouTube land or rumble land or whatever, uh, sometimes I, 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 I can kind of see over the years that I've watched people, how they sort of almost kind of fall apart a little bit or lose a sense of personal equanimity or balance when they're so focused. And sometimes I would even suggest to people maybe just kind of pulling it out and maybe going and watching a play sometimes or going to a museum or reading a novel. And for me, just doing my research over the last year, um, going into deep history, I already, you know, studied abroad for for quite a while in medieval and Renaissance. So I dug back into that and and, and found a resurgence in, in classical painting. And of course, I've been back uh, doing the church fathers and understanding that. And when I spend my time there just dealing just with ideas um, and something that has this sort of historical grounding. And I go back to what I used to have a more regular diet of, um, this sort of truth or stuff. There's something about it that seems kind of like junk food sometimes. So, uh, you know, that's that's an idea I might come to uh, here and then. And I I don't want to cite any specific examples, but I'm going to turn it over to Will for a moment. Uh, what comes to you when you think of inside the Medici? There's a place for realizing that there might be the, the this uh, cabal out there of evil cabal. I mean, we all woke up and eventually, you know, we even op- woke up to uh, good and evil. And, you know, the logos made flesh was eventually part of it. So what do you think when you think about uh, balancing in our own minds or what's going on in the world around us? Some of the ideas are that the devil wants to expose these things and we can be even agents of this externalization. And that uh, I saw something from Truthstream Media, you know, and they're kind of more of a secular slant. And they were just saying it just seems like we're feeding the beast. Uh, what, what do you take on it when you, when you think about this, Will? Uh, well, in, in terms of the medicine, the, part, the use of the medicine is to create balance and order so that we can address the chaos of this world. And we talked previously about opposing this concept of medicine with this emerging idea of the metaverse. And this 
you know, rabbit holes that proliferate and become exponential and lead to nowhere or wrap back around on themselves like the serpent eating its own tail. <laughs> yes. Um, That's a good metaverse, one. Metaverse that creates disorientation that, that pulls us away from uh, a, a kernel of truth that can hold um, back this process of, of, um, Revelation. I want to interrupt. Both of us kind of came up with this idea that the last couple of weeks that the the the, the metaverse, or I, I suppose what Zuckerberg's pushing, Meta, is probably a grand inversion of the Medixy. But that's going to take a little time, a couple of conversations for us to develop. Sorry about the interruption, Will. Can you go ahead, please? Sure. Um, and there's a you know the, the purpose of the Medixy is to create stamina. You know. Um, to to allow us to um you know deal with the daily struggles of life and the fatigue and the uh, uh, banality of, of of daily life and you know conspiracy kind of feeds a, it's like pornography for people who don't like pornography you know you get this client this constant you expect climax absolutely kind of manufacturing uh climax is is the um resource of this, you know, uh, hyper consciousness, technological, uh, world that we're living in is, uh, you know, we constantly have to look forward to these climactic moments. And I think the, the use of medicine is to stay in the balance in between and not have to expect these, uh, culminations or these, uh, you know, climactic moments to appear for us to, to feel like we're connected or that we have yeah. truth. Yeah. I mean, Vogelin, you know, I mean, and he's writing, you know, a generation ago, you know, what he would think about mega churches and people putting, you know, all, all of this. Um, but he said the real heroicism, and again, he's writing from a philosophical perspective. Um, but what he sees about Christianity, the real heroicism are those that can slog through faith of things unseen and have the stamina. That's the heroicism. But we're trained for somebody that has the dreams and the visions. And the Holy Spirit told me that last night. And just everything that's stroking, when the church fathers say the Holy Spirit chiefly is responsible for um, alerting you of your own sins. Um, but yes, and I wanted to finish on that point. But by, yeah, sometimes with uh, constraining this type of research, it almost... It has an addictive, almost lustful kind of quality to it. Well, you you compared it to like pornography. Yeah, uh, I think I was saying that the stamina that we're seeking through the medic C is confused, disoriented ah. by the, the climax uh, of of you know the nugget of conspiracy information that we're seeking out that connects the magic mind. bullet yeah. <laughs> the magic the magic bullet um the magic bullet the theory oh, i have tape called magic it's been a four years since i've done that one um yeah. uh, you know it reminds me of uh, the frankist school or we call it the french school postmodern reconstruction blah 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 which is of course you know it's it's an extension of the Sabbatean Francus, whose goal was to invert the whole of the world through uh, infiltration of info, uh, of universities. And certainly they got into the edu educational uh, system long ago. But uh, I always thought, um, whether you call it conspiracy has almost like thinking about like if you try to read um, French postmodernism, you sent what was the article you sent me? A thousand plateaus. And stuff that I could maybe stomach 10, 20 years ago, trying to read this stuff, this French intellectual stuff. And uh, it just reminds me of like the the hand that titillates you and never lets you uh, kind of uh, complete the activity. And I think Corn, you never have it in uh, conspiracy research. There, there really rarely is that, that moment of release personally Sometimes you think maybe, you know, I'm going to have a few more hits or I'm going to make it on social media or I could make a living out of this kind of stuff. But is there ever that real conf conf uh, uh, um, re resolution of waking people up? So for what purpose? That's an important question. For what purpose are we 
waking people up. And we have to remind ourselves, it's not that we shouldn't, but we have to hold this in balance and have a kind of personal restraint with this. And, you know, it's interesting because Aristotle, you know, is always saying we have this short term thing that we want and we have reason and we balance it with faith hopefully together hold this thing in a type of balance. Will, what do you, when you hear the restrainer, what comes to mind? I mean, you could think at a personal level or biblical prophecy um, or uh, restraint in inside of the medicsy. What, what comes to mind for you? Well, that, that's one of the issues that your recent turn in, in your, your video work has, has helped me make sense of is like where are we in this christian epic and uh what are we doing here and what are what are we striving for and you know growing up evangelical and kind of perceiving this hal lindsey eschatology of you know we're waiting the rapture or waiting the millennial kingdom or you know the we've got a we've got a foment this christian kingdom on earth and uh that that hasn't happened yet and we we just don't even look at the last you know, 2000 years of history and how the church has existed and how Christian we received Christianity in the first place. So um, the restrainer, you know, we've talked about this and um, thinking about what Christ left when he ascended into heaven and this process that I think that gets missed by most Christians of how, you know, the Roman Empire was um, conquered by a, a a sect of, of um, believers who were nonviolent and had no military or army. Beautiful. And yeah. That empire became, you know, the, the, the Christian West. And that without that, we would have never received the gospel. Um, or I don't know how we could have. Um, so thinking about what our. Conquered what the doing. Roman Empire through a, 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 the faith of a martyr. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just. And. These people, these these apostles, were on trial for turning the world upside down, and now we're experiencing, I guess, at the end of this age, you know, it going back the other way. Um, and again, the role of the restrainer is a bit interesting. Yeah. So, like, what are we participating in, or what is our participation in this Christian walk and in the kingdom? You know, if the kingdom is here, as you know, John the Baptist announced. But then Christ sort of uh, steps one step beyond that and says, my kingdom is not of this world. Yes. And so we're in this medicsy of the kingdom. Uh, what are we doing and, and what is what are our efforts for in the you know political or global or social sense is to, I think, hold back this process of iniquity and, you know, redemption through. Wow, sin that's good. I'm sorry. To do, uh, keep going. I'm sorry. I didn't want to walk over you. That's really good. Could you say that again? Uh, um, this, uh, you know, our efforts as Christians are to hold back the mystery of iniquity through stamina, restraint, uh, through not being swept away. And, and holiness, uh, personal holiness. And we just, that's just left over. It's what we can do instead of, you know, looking out instead of um, cleaning up the inside of ourselves. And we don't even think of that as a tactic anymore, that holiness can conquer the spirit of iniquity. But yeah, uh, you know, I finished the book uh, through a singularity with this thing called egregore, which is an artificially generated kind of thought form of, of earthly Jerusalem, which is an inversion. Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. Um, and so the Gnostics, without getting way into it, not for Vogelin, you could get tilt the Medici, derail society in two ways, that everything became spiritual up there, all platonic forms and perfection, denying our, our responsibility here with our families, with our society, with calling things out, with waking some people up. It's a real deal. We have to have a footing here. And yet at the same time, we can go the other way and just look at our creaturelessness, not, not, not just be with the gods, but just be with the creatures and instead pull these forms down and make a utopia or kingdom here, which also leads to derailment. So it could work either way. And that's why Gnosticism is a funny word when people bandy it about because it could be 
one or the other. And I believe through orthodox theology, a great balance comes because they had to fight and fight and fight. I know there's, you know, anti-Catholics are going to argue about this, but Western civilization for 1500 years is completely overlapped with the idea of the sanctity of the individual, the sanctity of, of birth and life and family. This was an inversion from the world before. But what it held together simply is the idea of a trinity had to be fought for. I mean, conquered the world, sometimes militarily, sometimes through martyrdom. But the idea of that precious Godhead and trinity had to be reserved. Everything outside of it, and Protestants accepted that for the most part, was heresy. But the other thing was that Christ was fully man and fully divine. So we have our minds at one time in the medic seat already um, here, have a foot in the kingdom, but we also have a foot in the physical. And he ordained for us a physical uh, a set of apostles and a chain of apostles, a physical church, physical sacraments, and they were important to him. And I'm not making a debate about whether you can be saved outside the sacraments, but that was the balance of Christ and the very nature. He wanted to give us some physical things so that we can commune with him physically and have a relationship. And the mass, sorry to sound a little too enthusiastic about that, the grandness of the mass, if you can open up your mind for a moment, and it was, you know, I never have, trust me, anti Catholic all my life. When you, the totality of a mass is the relationship between the perfect communion that was taken from Eve. And now instead of taking it, you're receiving it slowly, but it's the communion with all masses, East and West throughout all time, and a communion between the heavenly kingdom all at once participating almost through the eyes of God outside of time. And it's so extraordinary once your mind can open up to that. And I didn't know this would go there, but I don't know if we can kick that back to the restrainer or not. But I think part of the restrainment will be an attack on, I believe, the sacraments. And that might bring us now into this controversial territory that we're only going to touch on, which uh, is Archbishop uh, Vigano and Archbishop Schneider. So let's finish off talking a little bit about them. And that kind of leads us into the final segment of what we uh, want to talk about today with these two voices in the world, one Archbishop Vigano and another Archbishop Schneider, very high in the ecclesiastical world and the uh, hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church who have come out. This isn't a low nut now anymore. We got uh, Schneider and I think a couple others are going out and they have a very contrary opinion about the Pope and what's going on in the world. And so the way I want to approach this today, I know last time I kind of held Vigano in a high regard and I still tend to, but I want to have kind of a balanced view. So I'm going to maybe say a couple details. And I think uh, Will has some reservations about what's going on. So we're going to finish off about that. But in short, I think the consistency between them uh, that is Archbishop Schneider and Archbishop Vigano, is they tend to be oddballs, both in Catholicism in terms of just how modernity sees where we're at. They see the Enlightenment as a large Luciferian project. And frankly, I do too, if we're thinking of a Luciferian conspiracy, that what they're calling light is humanism, where man is the measure of all things. That's very much opposed to the church project and the church age, where our duty it's not so much to focus on our salvation all the time, but to glorify God, find out God's will for our life, and to live holy lives, uh, according to Orthodox uh, theology. And I think that's what they're holding to. And they said, you know, and it's very contentious how people hit, you know, Vatican II. But they're saying that that last 60 years has really turned a corner, culminating in the new Jesuit Pope, where he's ecumenical agenda, bringing on everybody, people putting everybody on equal footing, um, inviting everybody to partake in the Eucharist is just beyond um, anything in sacred scripture, anything that Jesus would have said, the apostles would have said. It's contrary to the magisterium and the oral tradition. And it's problematic. And they're speaking out about it. 
And so it's 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 a controversy in the church between traditional Catholics and people that just want to go along with the program. Uh, for people that don't like Catholicism, I would invite you to at least think that this is kind of interesting, that they're very being very specific about calling out the New World Order and the agents of it. And yes, he does seem to be, at least initially, to get the conversation started, talking about the deep state and and uh, the deep church and, and saying Trump, you know, and it looked like there's a little bit of left, right. He's dropped that kind of thing. He usually referred, E. Michael Jones said he's not for real because he's just talking about the uh, the lodge people and not the, the cabal people. But when you listen to him carefully, he very much knows about this agenda of what he calls the family of international finance. He knows how to use his code words. He knows what's going on, both him and Vigano. And they're very opposed to the transhumanist agenda, the V agenda. And I just think it's fantastic that there are voices of truth. And I think even if you're not a Christian, you have to be able to appreciate that. But certainly I understand some don't. There's some kind of controlled opposition or they're somehow going to attach themselves uh, to the uh, uh, NRA, is it the new apostolic reformation and post-constructionalism. And they're all kind of together, if not in terms of actual agency, in terms of a spiritual agenda. And maybe they are. Maybe spiritually, sometimes they're prompting a type of rebellion that we shouldn't do. So we're open to that conversation, or even as the current Pope would say, that dialogue. But I'm going to turn it over to you because uh, Will has checked out Schneider. He's checked out Vigano, uh, criticisms of Vigano. Um, what do you think, Will, what were some of your initial impressions? Um, can, you've gone through some of these tapes. To me, sometimes, I mean, I have to, my jaw drops. I'm just like, I can't believe somebody in the world, there's 7 billion people, political, you know, software engineers, whomever, that's saying these things. And I'm, I'm just like, that's, that's crazy. He's got a voice. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think back to what we were talking about with the restrainer a moment ago, there's some aspect of what Vigano is communicating or revealing in Schneider as well, that um, the church is occupied this place and it's been historically opposed in the enlightenment um to the uh builder's lodge we'll say <laughs> and uh why is it particularly the catholic church that's identified in the uh text of the um cabal uh side as this force the edom that has to be subdued before this messianic era can commence and um I see what Vigano is talking about is this these eclipsing churches of the the deep church the uh, the, the the emerging church that we're seeing this ecumenical vision of of Bergoglio, Pope Francis and this um, historical church of um, you know the the pre Vatican II I think is is what he's imagining um, as Doug and I have talked about the the church before the era of usury of the Middle Ages possibly. Um, could be seen as this moment in which this mystery of iniquity or this spirit of antichrist is unleashed and we're entering into this revolutionary period. So I see Vigano is witnessing um, the, the historical role of the church and the restrainer or this spirit that um, is held by the church in its um, ability to hold order and to hold back this, you know, um, this entropy or this this teleos of, of chaos and disorder and the bringing on of antichrist. And it's also identifying it as a, it's a it's a counterfeit order like the metaverse, where it gives us a sense of intersectionality and uh, brotherhood all, and all the and trans words, people. transgender, trans, ultimately yes. being transhuman or the death of human for something else or a new type of man, right? Right. And Schneider even, kind of, yeah, they, and both of them compare the Soviet and the Nazi project to the building of this new millennial man, this new type of man. Right. And, and it is that, and, and then that brings us to this issue of the Antichrist, uh, the appearance of the Antichrist. Is that going to be an actual physical man uh, on Mount Zion, or is it going to be, uh, you know, a, a kind of man? A kind of egregore, as you as you said, um, uh, 
And is that what this process is about, is sort of preparing the mind and the, and the will of humanity to to usher in this, this this vision of itself, this self-worship? Right. Yeah. I mean, and so we got these perennial themes going back to the garden. We were already created in God's image, but the serpent saying that you're going to be like God's, but you're going to get to decide good and bad. And so that's a consistent story in human affairs. Certainly it's a consistent story in um, sacred scripture. And um, so, so the more things change between 5G and the blockchain, the more things seem to come back to the promise of the serpent and this sort of consistency and even this thread um, from Genesis to Revelation. And we should probably kind of wind things down there because I think we got a, a lot a lot out there, a lot to think about, a lot to start with. Um, but we intend to, uh, to uh, kind of keep you abreast. Some of what I'm doing in my chapters, whether this final type of man or the possible Adam uh, uh, of the possible Antichrist is this uh, project of the Sephirot of the Tree of Knowledge or this Adam Kadam, which is, uh, you know, a unity. The type is not is is really a, a unity of, of, of thought and consciousness or the creation. It's a creation in motion from our own consciousness, whether or not it's just us uh, opening up ourselves to, to entities. And, uh, you know, we'll get into a little bit here and there in a balanced way of, you know, flipping on the 5G and this and that. Um, but what we're mostly looking at is a, talk, a platform, which is the Medixy, where we can see a consistency throughout time and over cultures um, of, of uh, what both Plato, uh, Vogelin, and um, even St. Paul could believe are certain truths. Of course, we hold on to the one truth that uh, Christ alone um, can redeem us and bring us into a new heaven and a new earth. It's been fun uh, recording with y'all today. And um, I'd like you to say a final uh, farewell there, Will. And we're going to shut, we're going to shut things down for the day. All right. No, thanks so much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure always to listen to you. Hopefully I don't lose all of your followers for you. <laughs> I, I, the uh, thing I like uh, about this guy, he's just amazing humility, reflection. And I said, we got to, well, let's do some shows together. And I, and I hope you enjoyed listening to Will and just how he's so open about the struggles that he's going through. Uh, just uh, hanging his family together and trying to understand what's going on together and holding his faith together. Um, and I think so many of us at different levels can identify with that. So this has been Dr. Deep State. I truly hope and pray you all are doing well. <laughs>